to pass them to one of us, coordinator. Okay, let's um, let's reassemble. Uh, when I'm short, we are not exactly staying on time, but. Um, so it's real. It's a real pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Up, up until recently, this uh, event has been dominated by Toronto, but we have a significant. <laughs> it's like the Leafs. The, the Canadians are finally taking over the Leafs. Well, that's not much of our competition there. But um, anyway, it's a really delight to welcome Dr. Susan Bartlett from uh, Montreal. She came in to, for the day. Spoke to our rheumatology group today. I had a wonderful lecture. Uh, so Susan's a um, full professor of medicine at uh, McGill University, primary appointments in clinical epidemiology and rheumatology and respirology, so she has a broad range of interests. Interestingly, she has kind of one foot in the, in the U.S. She's also an adjunct professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University in uh, Baltimore, one of the most outstanding medical schools in the U.S. Uh, so Susan has a broad range of interests, um, increasingly spondylitis, but she's had a lot of interest in uh, clinical outcomes in, say, rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma. And the center theme, I would say, has been the patient well-being. How do we actually measure the well-being of a patient? Um, and as you will see, it's, it's partly the psycho-emotional aspects of disease, but also functional outcomes. So she's a really very skilled clinical researcher on that domain. So Susan, it's great having you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Rob. It's my uh, great pleasure to be here. I'm actually from London, Ontario, so I feel like an Ontario person, even though I'm living in Montreal and have been there for the last 10 years or so. And what I'm going to talk with you about is the emotional impact that comes with living with AS and other um, inflammatory diseases such as psoriatic arthritis. And I have learned much of what I know from patients, from being in the clinic, from listening to stories, from hearing over time what it is like to live with these diseases. And so I start with a quote from Mark Twain. So what do we hear from patients? What are the kinds of things they talk about? I'm gonna show you a few slides from data from a survey that was done in the UK. I think it's very representative of what I've heard in Montreal, what I heard when I was working in Baltimore for 20 years. What are the concerns? Well, it's stiffness, it's pain, it's fatigue. Fatigue is a really big one. Fatigue is, is kind of the one that, the straw that breaks the, the camel's back. I can, I can deal with pain and I can deal with stiffness. I've got strategies for that, is what I hear. But that, the fatigue that makes me not want to do anything, it makes me too tired to even come to an event like this after putting in a day of work. So common concerns... But this, these are concerns that are ever-present. So when you look at how it's affecting people throughout the day, it's always in the back of their minds. It, it influences everything that they think about. Because living with AS, or living with uh, psoriatic arthritis, or rheumatoid arthritis, changes people and it changes their lives changes what happens at home, changes how you plan a vacation, where you'll go, what you'll do. So a tremendous impact on life, and it's no wonder really that we hear from patients that because of this ever-pervasive impact, because of the fact I can't really think about anything that I'm going to do without thinking how my disease may impact this. For instance, if I'm planning a vacation and I want to go away in February because we all know in Canada, really important to see if we can't get away and get some sunshine, right? Now, a little bit of warm temperatures. But many patients are very concerned. How am I going to feel? What if I have a flare? What if I pay all this money to go someplace and I'm not up to it? Do I do it? So it's a special kind of uncertainty that you're living with every day. And when you put this symptom profile together, the pain and the stiffness and the fatigue, and you combine that with how it affects everyday life, it is no wonder that people take a real big hit. And so when we look at the rates of depression and high levels of anxiety in people who have axle, spondyl, uh, axle disease or ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis or any of the inflammatory arthritis, we see that the rates of anxiety and the rates of depression 
are much higher than they are in the general population. And that's understandable, I think, because of the, the very many ways that everyone's life is affected. From the survey, I know that uh, uh, Gerald mentioned this a little bit earlier. You can see the poster out there as well. In terms of the comorbidities, mental health, number two. And I say this to you, and I say this to the group in Toronto, and there's not a lot of surprise, but I'll tell you, when I say it to other rheumatologists, my rheumatology colleagues in Canada and in the United States, in fairness, in Europe as well, it is a surprise. And then they kind of scratch their heads and they say, well, but you know, it's a painful, chronic condition. Who wouldn't be depressed? As if that should be or may be part of the condition, but it's not. And it shouldn't be. And it actually complicates things enormously. And the thing about depression and anxiety is we have effective treatments. And we can absolutely help you to feel a lot better. And that's really what I want to do this evening, is talk about how that works. But first, let me say a little bit about depression and RA. And sorry, RA is so much of what I do every day. I'll lapse into it. Depression and AS and psoriatic arthritis. A recent systematic review came out. It included nearly 5,000 patients. So this is a lot of information that's combined together to give us a clearer picture. And it showed unequivocally that depression is very common. In fact, 15% of people meet the criteria for treatment for moderate to severe depression. Are 15% getting treatment? Absolutely not. I don't know what the figure is of who's being treated, but I know even in the general population, a lot of people go without treatment because they don't realize that treatments are available and that treatments work. And treatment, by the way, isn't taking a pill. I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, but. Uh, antidepressants have an important place. Many people are on antidepressants and many people continue to be depressed on antidepressants because antidepressants will only help a small number of people and it's people with very severe symptoms. And yet one in 11 people are on antidepressants. Yet get as much benefit eating Smarties. Maybe a little bit more because at least the Smarties have chocolate. So what is the impact of depression? Well, it changes you, it changes your body. People who are depressed absolutely have worse symptoms. It's not in their head, they're not imagining this. Their symptoms are worse, their pain is worse. If they have psoriatic arthritis, their itching can be a lot worse. Their disease is often more severe. They have a larger number and more intensive side effects to the treatments that they're taking. So they absolutely feel worse. They have much more fatigue because fatigue is very much part of the picture of depression. But it affects their social function and their physical function. So we see much higher rates of disability and withdrawal. You know, when you're not feeling good, when you're feeling down, you just feel like it's more effort than it's worth. And that's a cycle that becomes really problematic over time because the more you withdraw, the less opportunity you have to be with people and the less opportunity you have to have fun and enjoyable experiences. So think about what happened just a few minutes ago when we had Laura leading us in exercise. That was fun, right? It, it was a group experience. She made it really enjoyable. But most of us do much better when we're out around other people and we have shared experiences. And so when you don't feel up to going out and being with others and you withdraw, you become more and more isolated and psychologists like me really worry about that because that is a scenario in which the depression can get worse and the anxiety can definitely get much worse. People who are clinically depressed also have less confidence in medication, in their providers. They're less hopeful about their ability to feel better. That's really, really important because that's part of depression. In fact, we could give you medication. Cardiac medication is infamous for this. You give people certain kinds of cardiac medication and they become depressed. And their thinking changes. And they become much more pessimistic. But the problem is, if you have less confidence in your providers, you think they're good providers, but they're just not going to be able to help you for some reason or you feel like medications, there's great medications. We heard about them tonight. There has never been a better time 
to have these diseases because we have never had as many medications that work as well as they do. But people are depressed because of that perception that they have, because of the mud-colored glasses that comes with depression. It just feels to them like the medications won't work as well. And in fact, there is some evidence that suggests that if you do have clinical depression, the treatments don't work as well. Because depression has an inflammatory component to it as well. On the other hand, there are some of these new treatments that actually help with depression, too. So, all the more reason why it's really important to talk with your rheumatologist about how you're feeling. They want to know how your body's feeling, they need to know about your back, but they also need to know how your soul is feeling. And if you're feeling discouraged, and if you're feeling, if you're just feeling down, that's really important information. Because people who are depressed are less adherent to treatment, they're more sedentary, they tend to use more alcohol, and they tend to gain weight. And so all of these things, of course, are problematic. They make the conditions that we live with worse. So what I'm trying to do is build a case for you to convince you that your rheumatologist actually needs to know how you're feeling. Your rheumatologist isn't going to be the one to help you necessarily with those feelings, but they do need to know because that, that's part of who you are, and they need to treat all of you. And treating all of you can make a real difference. So how do you know if you're depressed? Well, I'll show you the tools that we use. These are available online. You can just Google them and you'll find them. And if you're scoring 10 or higher on this particular test of depression, the PHQ-8, that really means you do need to think about what's going on and talk with someone. So the kinds of things that people say are, I'm feeling tired all of the time. I can sleep for 10 hours and I'm still exhausted. I feel sad. I feel little joy. I am easily irritated. I just feel like being by myself. There are different aspects and different people experience depression differently, but these are the most common kinds of statements that people make. So I've highlighted, if you were more days than not in the last two weeks, would endorse these statements. That's an important sign to pay attention to. And similarly with anxiety, how do we know if your anxiety is higher than desirable? Because everybody gets anxious, everybody gets stressed from time to time. Who could not be stressed? in 2018. But how do you know if, if your anxiety is at a level where it's getting in the way, it's no longer helping you, but it's actively interfering? Well, once again, if you're scoring 10 or higher on this, and you can, you can see the kinds of items that people say, when I just can't get my brain to stop, I can't fall asleep at night. Interestingly enough, if you're waking up too early, if you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, that's a pretty important sign in terms of diagnosing depression. If you can't fall asleep, on the other hand, that's anxiety. So if you feel nervous and anxious and agitated, if you're irritable, uh, if you just have this sense that something bad is going to happen but you're not sure, that's anxiety. We don't know a lot about anxiety because, frankly, we haven't spent much time studying it. But we do know, and I can tell you with 100% confidence, this is something we can fix. In fact, anxiety disorders are something that we can cure. Don't get to say that very often. But helping you with anxiety has everything to do with helping you look at the way you're talking to yourself. And we all talk to ourselves all of the time. In fact, I'm talking to you right now, and I'm probably speaking at a rate of about... Mm, 225, 240 words a minute. But there's a conversation that's going on in the back of my head at about 350 words a minute. It's not just me, by the way. You're doing the same thing, too. And it's, you know, wonder what time it is. I'm kind of hungry. I wonder what I'll have for dinner. For me, it's, I wonder how many people are looking at their phones right now. So we always have this background conversation going on, and a lot of times we don't realize that the conversation we're having can actually make us feel much more agitated. And so it's really learning 
to understand what you're saying to yourself, and then talking to yourself the way you'd talk to a good friend, being supportive rather than critical. I like to say stop shooting all over yourself. You know, I should be doing this, I should do this, I should make sure that I've got dinner on the table, I should make sure that the house... Sometimes it's toning that conversation down a lot. So when should you speak to somebody about how you're feeling and who should you speak with? It doesn't need to be someone like me. It doesn't need to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. In fact, you know, we're probably best able to help people who are really struggling and have been struggling for a while. On the other hand, there are many, many people who are very well qualified to help sort out if, in fact, you would benefit by seeing somebody like me. And the first person I would tell you to talk to is the nurse in your office, in your rheumatologist's office, if you're lucky enough to have a nurse. And in, in Quebec, many of our offices don't have nurses, so we don't have that luxury. But nurses are great. They, they're trained for this, and they have a really good sense about it, and they're usually pretty easy to talk to. I'm not saying don't talk to your rheumatologist if you, you feel like you can, but if that feels a bit intimidating, physiotherapist, your pharmacist, really any member of the healthcare team that you feel comfortable about, just start the conversation. Start the conversation. It doesn't have to be long. It won't be involved or detailed, but at least you can get the ball rolling. Or you might feel more comfortable talking to someone in the clergy a priest, or a minister, or an imam, or whomever. It may be somebody at the local YMCA who's running stress management programs. Because you know what? All of the elements of stress management are exactly what we do for anxiety disorders. So there's help in many, many places. If you're working and you have EAP, a couple of sessions with your EAP counselor can also, can also make a real difference. But we also have some great resources that are now available online, many of them that were developed right here in Canada. And part of the reason I'm here tonight is because the CSA has asked me to work with them to try and bolster and to bring more resources and put them online and make them available. Because there's so much that you can do yourself just by being more aware. And it starts with understanding first and foremost that yes, this is part of your life, but this does not define your life. And it needs to not define your life. You need to get your life back and you need to figure out how you're going to get on the rest of your life. Taking into account, you can't ever get rid of this and you can't push it entirely out of the way. That can be a problem too. But how do you find a place for it? You need to learn how to manage things like flares. Because flares can be one of the biggest problems. You're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing and then all of a sudden out of the blue, you're exhausted. You feel terrible. What did I do to deserve this? You didn't do anything. It's just part of the disease. The unpredictability is really, really hard to live with. Because it usually happens that when you have something really important, or when we're going into the holidays, that's when these flares sneak up behind you, right? So learning to manage, self-manage your disease effectively means being a lot like a firefighter. A firefighter spends a lot of time doing the preventive work, making sure they're doing a lot of things every single day to feel good and to help them feel the best that they can be. But a firefighter also has very specific skills so that when a fire erupts, they know exactly what to do. You need both kinds of skills to do this. You need to figure out how you're going to claim your life back and live your best life. And that does mean coming to terms with AS. It does mean finding a new normal, a different normal. And it often means allowing yourself to grieve and to accept that things are going to be different. But different doesn't have to be bad. That's why I started out with the quote from Mark Twain. Yes, you'll learn things that you would learn in no other ways. But many people, as they come through and live with these diseases and become more comfortable, find that there's deeper, more meaningful relationships with family members, find that they learn things about themselves that is reassuring and that is comforting, and find a purpose in moving forward.
You're going to have to learn to be more flexible. There's no two ways about it. You can't do things the way you used to do them. Get used to it. It's a little bit, I think, like becoming a mom. Like, I could never do anything at 100% once I started having a family. Everything at best gets 80%, and that wasn't easy to come to terms with, but I did, kind of, over time. Be flexible. Be flexible when it comes to what you're expecting of yourself from work and from family and, and from friends. You'll need to create a network, a network that can give you both support and emotional care. And all of this is going to be dependent on learning to be a better communicator. And on this, there's no alternative. You're going to have to educate your family and your friends and your coworkers and teach them how to interact best with you. You're going to have to be honest with your healthcare team about how you're actually feeling. Because unless you do these things, the people around you who love you and care for you and want to support you have absolutely no idea how to do it. You know, what you see all of the time is that the person who has the disease feels like a burden and feels guilty. And so they keep a lot inside. They don't want to share it. They're not comfortable with how they feel. They're not comfortable with saying, I don't want to do this. I'm too tired tonight. They're worried that the family members or the friends or the co-workers won't understand. And a lot of times they say to themselves, well, I should, I should be able to move forward. I, I should be able to do this. I'm letting myself off the hook. That's not right. On the other hand, the other people in your life are saying a lot of things to themselves, too, when they see you begin to withdraw. They're wondering, what did I do? Like, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Did I make them angry? Am I bothering them? So you act differently. They act differently. This is the perfect scenario for misunderstandings. And the only way through this is to talk about it. And it's not easy. It's not easy, but it gets easier with time. It's a lot like playing tennis, you know, like the first few times you go out on the court and you try and hit that ball and it just doesn't work. But the more you practice, the easier it gets. And it's more honest and it's more authentic and it's much more rewarding when you can let yourself come through. And when your family and your friends and whomever you choose to share this with really can understand how it is you're feeling, what you're going through, and why sometimes you do just need to shut down, go away, go in the room, go under the duvet, bring your bar of chocolate with you. Well, maybe that's my fantasy. I want to reinforce what Laura was saying about moving. Moving is the best medicine. You know, exercise is important. It's really important for everybody. For you, it's absolutely essential because exercise is one of the best antidepressants that we have. For people with mild to moderate depression, exercise is as effective as medication. It's as effective as therapy. It's free, and the side effects of exercise are great. In fact, the Canadian Family Physicians Association has taken the position since 2011 that for everyone with mild to moderate depression, first line of treatment needs to be exercise. But you know where exercise is really magic? with anxiety. There is nothing that helps your body calm down and relax like exercise. So did you feel better? I felt better just after our little exercise interlude that we had a few minutes ago. You get more energy when you exercise. You sleep better. These effects are within a few days of exercising. You don't have to do this for six months to feel better. In our randomized controlled trials, people tell us within a week they're sleeping much better. You feel more confident. You, you just feel better. Your self-esteem goes up. And when people begin to exercise, they often begin to do a whole lot of other things, like they eat healthier. They feel like doing that. They stop smoking. And stopping smoking is really important, because one of the things we understand is that if you smoke and you use even the very best medications that are out there, your medications are not going to work nearly as well. Exercise helps you manage your weight, and we know that weight is also a major barrier to having treatments work as well as they could. So what's not to love about exercise? The side effects are phenomenal. If you'd like some more information, 
here are some resources that I routinely refer my patients to that I have a lot of confidence in. The uh, CSA has some materials, and as I say, we're working on new materials and more materials for you. There's great materials online in the UK. The UK has been 20 years ahead of us in terms of developing materials for patients to help them self-manage. There's the Arthritis Society. Um, the Arthritis Society has done amazing things in the last year or so. There's been this massive revamp of the website, and you're going to find a lot of great stuff, and a lot of good stuff, really good stuff that I'm very comfortable with because they had me go through it in detail around mental health. The U.S. Arthritis Foundation has good things as well. If you're concerned about your mood, then I absolutely suggest you go online to the British Columbia Antidepressant Skills Workbook. This is one of the best resources out there, and people from all over the world are using it. It's available in something like 13 languages, and it's a workbook that you go through, and it helps you learn to understand what you're saying to yourself. It helps you assess your level of depression. It helps you set goals around exercise. It helps you get moving and move in a more positive direction, and it lets you know when maybe it might be time to talk to somebody more. So I will stop there, and um, we will have a chance to have some questions in that in a few minutes if you have more questions. Thank you, Susan. That was really wonderful. Thank you very much.